Welcome to Biblical Insights with David Gooding, a Myrtlefield House podcast. When we study scripture, we ask two basic questions. What does it say? Why does it say it? What I'm doing, therefore, is looking for what I would call the thought flow. This is not just a philosophical theory. There's gospel actually works. Let me tell God what I think of God. Let God pay all so long as God be mine. Paul's epistle to the Colossians reminds us that ultimately Christ is all we need. He is our initial salvation, our growth and sanctification, and our final glorification. Studying Colossians reminds us of our status as God's children, showing us how to walk with Christ while avoiding the enemy's pitfalls. In this episode, David Gooding discusses Paul's warnings against any teaching that turns Christianity into a form of spiritual slavery. He reminds us of the riches we have in Christ, as he warns us not to be robbed by the deceptions of man-made philosophies. What methods are the right methods to use in developing spiritual progress in our lives and in the lives of the others? We surely shall need wisdom, shan't we? to know how to do that, and when it comes to recipes for the development of spiritual life, some recipes, some methods, some means are wise, because they are God-given means, God-given methods. They come with the very wisdom of God's tactics and strategy behind them. And some means and methods are not wise. Some of them, in fact, are positively harmful. And when we have seen something of the wisdom of God, then we shall listen to Paul warning us about other recipes that are not wise. And if we uh, allow ourselves to be deceived by them, that is precisely what will happen. They will deceive and make spoil and judge us and rob us and enslave us. So then if we would be preserved from wrong methods and be held to the right wise methods of God in developing holiness, then once more we shall have to listen to Paul. And so in this first paragraph in chapter 2, he now explains why he spent so much time at the end of chapter 1 talking about his striving for us. For surely we are included. He strives for you at Colossae and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And that must include us, mustn't it? Just think of it, my brother. It's a long while ago now, Paul sitting in prison, when he lifted his hand to sign the letter, the chain dangled and he said, remember my chain, won't you? I don't like writing letters. I don't know about you, Patrick. You're probably good at it. But tired, imprisoned, he took the opportunity to write a letter. It not only uh, saved, in a practical sense, the Colossians in their spiritual development, but here we are this morning reading it. He had a concern for us who haven't seen his face in the flesh. And if we listen to him, he tells us the reason why he has told us about his striving for us. One, verse two, the positive reason. Their hearts may be comforted that they being knit together in love and unto all riches are the full assurance of the understanding that they may know the mystery of God, even Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. We must listen to him because it's listening to him that we shall find encouragement in our spiritual development and we shall there find a secret of unity amongst the Lord's people uh, they being knit together in love and it is reading him and listening to him that our hearts will eventually be filled with all riches of full assurance there will come into our lives a sense of wealth of riches of treasure, and it will give us a tremendous assurance, and with it, encouragement. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of the weaker sort that Paul talks of in his letters, 
And when it comes to making spiritual progress, you know, I easily get uh, mm, discouraged. Well, perhaps you would if you had to start so far back as I had to start. You want to do what's right. You want to go on with the Lord. You want to conquer certain weaknesses and defects in your life. And you take it to the Lord and you strive and you pray. And you determine that you're going to be different and better and so forth and so on. And how many times do you have to come back defeated? And you feel you're getting nowhere far. And what happens then? Why you get discouraged? Yeah. And then you begin to feel like giving up. And then if you're not very careful, you get disillusioned. You say, is this thing true anyway? Or is this the preachers, like they often do, exaggerating? Like to know how the preacher gets on in his own life anyway. See, he preaches the theory with great gusto, but how does it work? That's the thing. And then, little by little, you come to get depleted in your spiritual energies and you feel poverty-stricken. I was talking to a good man, and let him be nameless. He won't mind my saying it. Devoted to the Lord like you I have known. And now after 20 years, he says to me, David, it's like slavery. When do I earn a time off? What was being told? I got to devote 24 hours a day, 36 hours a day, seven days a week and eight days to the Lord. When do I earn a little time off? Ah, dear man of God, actually. But so been belabored with exhortation to be devoted, that it's become like a slavery, like making bricks without straw. It can happen. And folks get disillusioned. And Paul comes along and says to us, if we're in that state, like he said to the mariners on the boat that was about to go down into the depths of the Mediterranean, gentlemen, you ought to have listened to me. <laughs> Oh, if you're going to make progress in the Christian life, listen to Paul. What will he do? He'll start by encouraging you. Why encourage? Well, listen to him, as we just heard. You've got the Lord in you. You say, I haven't made many, much progress. Well, now let me repeat. If you're a believer, and in spite of that, the Lord is in you. The hope of glory. Oh, don't forget it. You consider the um, resources you have and let them encourage your heart and all let them bring a certain wealth into your life a sense of the glory of what God has done for in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden oh Forget just for the moment, if it isn't wicked to say, your strong desire to make progress, allow yourself to sit down and take the lid off this box and delve into the treasure. It is, you see, as if I may use a humble parable and uh, may I be forgiven. But suppose you were out to one of these uh, famine-stricken lands and you saw the need of the people and you said to themselves, poor dear folks, they are so weak, how will they get to the centre for the distribution of the food? You say, I know what, I'll get them a Range Rover. So they could come to Belfast and you buy a Range Rover and you charter a short sky van and here the thing is, and you already arrive in the middle of these dear folks, the thing lands and out rolls the Range Rover. You'll say, now my good chief man, you the chief here, right old chap, now this is for you, you'll say, and you can use this to go and fetch the uh, wheat and that will make it easier for you, you'll say. And off you fly and come back in a year. Where's the Range Rover? Can't see it anywhere. But how did you get on, Mr. Chief, with that Range Rover? No, oh, he said that was a great disappointment, really. The thing was so heavy. <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> what do you say? What do you mean it was so heavy? Well, all that weight, tons and tons of it, and we pushed and we pulled and we put the donkeys on the front, but. You know, we're weak, we're not like you Westerners who are strong and have ten meals a day. We only have a little food and we're weak and we... Well, we made matters ten thousand times worse trying to push that thing and pull it. Bad enough when it was empty. When we got it loaded, it was impossible. <laughs> you say, my good man, I don't understand this. Um, don't you realise there's an engine in it? You say, what do you mean, engine? 
So you go to the thing and you undo the bonnet and you say, look, this engine. Well, you say, we have, but that heavy stuff there, that's part of the trouble. We thought about cutting it out, one of the, you know how to make the thing lighter. Oh, so you haven't understood. No wonder your progress is slow and you got discouraged. Do you think I'd have given you the thing like that to make your life more difficult? And then you demonstrate what this, what he thinks is heavy, bit of iron, is. It's an engine. All the potential. It was there all the time. Well, my dear fellow believers, how often we can be stupid, if, at least if you're like me, and think that God's way of sanctification is a slavery like Pharaoh imposed on the Egyptians, and I need to sit down and take the bonnet open. You say, you're not going to preach Paul, are you, all that heavy theology? <laughs> Oh, well, perhaps that's our trouble. We think it's heavy theology, don't we? Romans and Ephesians and Colossians. And we want something lighter. Oh, friend, it's only heavy in the sense it's heavy with glory and heavy with potential and heavy with riches. Listen to Paul so that you come to see the tremendous wealth of this mystery. For in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. And you are filled, fulfilled in him. We shall make more progress sometimes if we learn to sit down and take the lid off what we've already been given. When we find the riches that are in Christ, you know, it will lead to unity. Sometimes our recipes divide Christian from Christian. That's a sad thing, isn't it? Christ unites. And all the assurance it gives. You'll see, basic to all true progress, there is necessary, I nearly said psychologically necessary, confidence, assurance. It is possible if we lose sight of these great riches, that in the end we get so, so disgusted with our failures as Christians that we come to doubt our veritable salvation in love. And when doubt like that enters in, it saps all strength for spiritual progress. Or oh, if you have care for anybody, anybody's soul, do like Paul, see to it that you lead them to full assurance and do your best to fill their lives with a sense of the wealth of the riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You say, why is the thing hidden? Why are the riches hidden? Why aren't they obvious? Well, an answer to that would be found in 1 Corinthians 2. They're hidden from the world, of course. A wisdom that none of the princes of this world knew, as otherwise they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for us who love him. Don't say that that's a description of heaven, that's a description of now. For God has revealed these things to us by his Spirit. They're hidden to the world, and they remain hidden to the unspiritual believer. But God has given us his Spirit, you may think Paul is heavy writing. There is a Holy Spirit available, you know, to interpret, to make it real, to give us understanding. For we have in God's Word and in this scheme of salvation the very mind of Christ. These are the positive reasons, then, why we should listen to Paul. The negative reasons are uh, that... Uh, we must be careful against false recipes. This I say that no one may delude you. That is verse 4. And again in verse 8, Take heed that there shall be anyone that make a spoil of you through his philosophy and vain deceit. You see, it is possible for people to delude us with clever speaking, very entertaining speakers. But watch out that none of them take you from what Paul says, won't you? On his own account, he says he's not a very good speaker. 
Yeah. But is this Zephyr now? Uh, you had a friend and you wanted to show your friend your love and kindness and you bought them a bowl and uh, gave it to them in a box. And uh, when you left, they undid the box and in this box from the local gift shop, there was this bowl thing sort of a dullish brown, a little tinge of blue in it. You said, that's a funny looking bowl. Oh, well, I have respect for my friend, I'll put it on the sideboard. And then, then someone else came to your house and they said, what's this old thing here, this funny old brown thing? <laughs> you said, well, that's a bowl given to me by a friend of mine, so I put it there. I don't see much in it myself. Uh, uh, uh. No, he says, you know, I mean, these things have gone out of fashion, you see. I tell you what, uh, you want to go down to Marks and Spencer's and they've got some beautiful bowls, you know, with nice pink flowers on the side and only cost you seven pounds. So don't you go and you get your seven pounds bowl out of Marks and Spencer's and you take the old brown thing and put it out in the garden, grow tulips in it. And then uh, uh, you come back. Well, Who is this? This bowl. Uh, he said, well, we didn't like it very much. And a friend of mine, he said he knew a better thing than that. And he got, got me to get one from Marks and Spencer's. Who you say, well, where's the original bowl I gave you? Well, it's out in the garden, but uh, in tulips in it. He said, know what that bowl was? There's a Ming Dynasty bowl. That's worth a hundred thousand. Take care that nobody rob you. What Paul is putting before us is a Christ in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. Don't let anybody rob you of it. With his cheap recipes for spiritual progress. Paul isn't campaigning against philosophy as a method of thinking. Philosophy is a very good thing. It teaches us to use logic to examine the truthfulness of our statements. He's talking here about theosophy, with all its theories of the universe and angels and uh, demiurgs and all that kind of thing, into the detail of which we do not now have time to go. Let that come another occasion. Let's just get hold of the big contrast. His philosophy, says Paul, is after the tradition of men. At his very best, what would it be compared with our blessed Lord in whom all the fullness of deity resides bodily. Then let's listen to Paul and make sure that nobody by his persuasive speech takes us away from the vast treasure in Christ and gets us going after his man-made theory and philosophies. Thank you for listening to Biblical Insights with David Gooding. If you're interested in more of Dr. Gidding's teachings, check out our other podcast series or visit our website, myrtlefieldhouse.com, for free ebooks, sermons, and study notes.